Good, uh, good morning everybody. My name is Johan Ensman and this is our first tutorial session. So uh, welcome, first of all, to all our participants. I know a lot of you have traveled pretty far. Uh, so welcome here and thanks for, for an early start this morning. Um, our screen here is a little bit small, so uh, just to get a little bit of a better view, I would suggest, you know, classroom style. We try to get this as front as possible. Um, but it would, uh, it, would, uh, it would help if you move uh, front. Thanks a lot. All right, so let's get started. So <clears throat> our first tutorial is called em Empower a Billion Lives, Understanding the Principles of Energy Access. And you may know that PELS, the Power Electronic Society of the IEEE, has a very, very strong initiative as part of their um, outreach and human, human humanitarian uh, uh, initiatives within the society, and this is sort of a, the key keystone uh, initiatives for 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 PALS. And uh, um, Deepak and uh, uh, Srilal is going to present basically what is going on. You know, you may have heard it. You may have got emails through PALS website and give us uh, a better understanding how this, this whole will fold, uh, fold out. Now I think uh, for all of you in the room, probably Deepak is not unknown. Uh, Deepak Devon is a professor uh, and the John Epping, Epping, Epping Chair um, uh, and the GRA eminent scholar at, and the director of the Center of Distributed Energy at Georgia Institute of Technology, Georgia Tech as we know it, in Atlanta, <coughs> Georgia. His field of interest is power electronics, power systems, smart grids, and distributed control of power systems. He works very closely with utilities, industry, and active involved with research, teaching, entrepreneurship. You know, you may have known that he started a few, few activities. Um, he was a founder and, and chief scientist of Rentec in California, <coughs> and uh, he's, uh, he was also the president and CTO of that, of that organization in 2011-14. Deepak is a elected member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, uh, um, NIE as we may, uh, know it, um, and he's a member of the National Academics Boards and, uh, on Energy and Environmental Systems. He's a fellow of the IEEE, past pe president of the Power Electronics Society, and the recipient of the IEEE William <coughs> Neal Field Medal um, Award. Um, it's got a lot of patents uh, and several, several papers. Thanks a lot, and thanks for participating here with, today with us. Thank you. And then we have uh, on his uh, right hand side, uh, Shulard uh, Liptak, and um, he is, they're going to do together a tutorial. Um, Liptak is a research engineer at the Center for Energy, uh, Distributed Energy <coughs> at Georgia Tech. He comes with a unique uh, experience over several countries. He worked as an NGO in Malawi and Haiti, uh, especially on off-grid solar systems in Kenya. Um, he is an energy specialist uh, in a very good understanding of math and electrical aspects, and his primary research uh, obviously is for off-grid energy systems. Thanks, Levi. Right, he's also a graduate from Georgia Tech and an MS in, with an MS in computer engineering. So that's going to be the session. Who's going to be first? Yep. Can this one introduce the <coughs> Thanks, Johan. And uh, very nice to see all of you bright and early uh, out here. Uh, I really, I think, appreciate that. Uh, this is a very unconventional topic for a, uh, you know, a, a, a tutorial at, uh, at, at conference. Uh, but I think it's really a sign of uh, the times that, uh, that, are, that are emerging. So, so welcome to the, uh, the tutorial on uh, Empower a Billion Lives. Uh, I think uh, at, at a high level, I just want to start off saying that, you know, the area of uh, energy access has really received uh, very little attention from the technical community. Okay, I mean, we've been busy writing papers on esoteric topics and, uh, you, know, you know, great control techniques and great converter topologies and, and this is all, all good. And I think we've kind of looked at uh, energy access as being essentially low-tech solutions for people who really can't afford much more. And I think what we are beginning to see is that's really far from the truth. I mean, we I have an opportunity to apply some of the most creative, you know, most advanced solutions that we can develop in the area of energy access to solve problems that are very, uh, very challenging otherwise. Uh, and I think, uh, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, this tutorial will give you a glimpse of it. 
Um, as Johan mentioned, you know, uh, IEEE PELS has uh, launched a very big initiative. Uh, we call it Empower a Billion Lives, and you'll learn a lot about it today. Uh, it's a global competition uh, that uh, is really, uh, you know, kind of uh, targeted towards developing uh, uh, solutions that can scale rapidly. And what is the reason for scale? I think this is, you know, part of what uh, Zillard and uh, I will be uh, will be talking about. Um, just one thing to kind of, uh, you know, let you know that uh, uh, in addition to the competition itself. Uh, we have another new initiative that uh, you will find more information on outside, uh, and it's the IEEE Decentralized Energy Access Solutions Workshop, the DEAS -E Workshop. Uh, and uh, this is going to be held in, uh, in Puerto Rico uh, in, uh, in late January, early February of, uh, of next year. It's also going to be the uh, location of the regional round of this competition. So again, I would uh, this community in particular, I think, is very, very appropriate for being involved in DEAS. Uh, and uh, I'd like to kind of uh, direct your attention to that. So with that, uh, enjoy your uh, hour and a half with us. I think, uh, you know, Zillard's going to lead the, uh, the way and uh, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the principles of energy access uh, and, you know, what it means and what it entails. Uh, and I'll uh, follow up after that and talk uh, a little bit about the, uh, the workshop itself. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Sila Liptak. I'm a research engineer at Center for Distributed Energy, and I'm one of the organizers of this competition. Uh, just for your information, we, you see a number of recording devices across the room. Uh, the reason being is that uh, for this competition, we already have more than 120 teams registered. And, uh, you know, uh, most of those teams are actually not located in the U.S. And we would like to make this session available for them. So we will be uh, talking to you and thank you very much for coming. But we will be also targeting these registered teams who are uh, already working on the competition. Uh, after this session, we are going to have a quick mashup with uh, whoever would like to uh, form a team and become more engaged uh, with, the, with the competition. All right. And once again, if you have any questions, please feel to, free to interject, you know, ask it. We are, we are happy to answer whatever questions may arise now or in the future. Uh, you know, feel free to email us at billionlives at IEEE.org. We are happy to answer anything. All right. So what are we going to talk today? So we divided uh, today's presentation into uh, five major topics. Um, the first one, what we call the grand challenge. This is really framing the problem. What is it that, that we are trying to, to tackle? Uh, we are going to quickly look at existing solutions today, what people are trying to do in different fields, both from a technology standpoint and from a business standpoint. Uh, then we are going to start looking at uh, you know, the challenges that are flowing from this and the opportunities that it opens up. Um, then we are going to uh, give a, a brief overview of the competition, how we are thinking about you know, this um, issue can be moved forward. Uh, and uh, go a little bit more detail on the on the competition judging. All right, so let me start with the grand challenge. So, how many people in the room do know what are the sustainable development goals are the SDGs? All right. So, in the development community, this is a buzzword that uh, you may have heard, SDG, SDG 7, SDG 8. So basically what happened in 2015, as the Millennium Development Goals phased out, the United Nations came up with a new set of goals for global development. And they defined these 17 goals that you see on the screen that basically say that this is what we need to achieve as a human race to be able to move forward by 2030. And you can see that, uh, that SDG number 7 is universal, affordable energy access for all. It's a very ambitious goal, but one interesting aspect of that is that, as you can see, it is actually underlying many of the other aspects of development. So uh, energy is very tightly tied with agriculture, with healthcare, with education, with gender equality, with water supply, especially with economic growth and productivity. Uh, we would like to encourage you, you know, to visit our website and you can read more about all these mechanisms. You know, electricity enables all these variety of services. But I believe everybody in the room knows very much what happens when the power goes out and we are left without Wi-Fi and without our life for an extended period of time. So we all agree that this is an extremely important step 
in, uh, in economic development. So let's see what are we talking about when we talk about energy access. And, you know, historically, people have been thinking about this, that, all right, well, if I have energy access, this is where I am. I have all the, uh, you know, um, advantages of modern life. And if I don't have access, then I'm somewhere here. I, I have a candle and I'm sitting in the dark and I don't have any, you know, electric appliances. But, you know, the truth is, is not that simple. The truth is that there is an entire scale, an entire, you know, five tiers between the two. And uh, this is exactly what uh, the Sustainable Energy for All initiative and the World Bank ASMAP, uh, you know, try to capture in, in a new way of measuring energy access, which is, uh, which is known in their, in their uh, Beyond Access report as energy access tiers. And they define these five tiers in, in, uh, in, in this document that describes not simply, you know, how, what, what do you define as actual full tier access, but they also what availability, you know, how many watts, how many watt hours. So actually uh, translate it into, into energy terms. This gives us a much better way of scoping, you know, where we are. One of the issues was that, you know, in many countries, uh, if a single house in a village had access to the grid, then it was the country that the entire village is electrified. That one house may have had access of two hours a day, but you know, from statistically speaking, it was you know, accounted for as fully electrified, which is, which is a huge issue. Um, so let's look at what is the actual definition that is being used today. Uh, so once again, this is coming from ASMAP. Uh, we are going to make this presentation available, or if you're participating on the conference, you already have this available uh, on, on, the, on the USB stick. Um, and so you will be able to see all these rep reports we are referring to. We would like to encourage you, you know, to, to dig deeper. Uh, but basically, what is defined that if you are under uh, 3 watts of, uh, of rated power or 12 watt hours of daily delivered energy, then that is defined as no access to energy. If you are moving beyond that, you have to be able to provide this for at least minimum 4 hours a day, minimum 1 hour in the evening. Or to access tier two, you have to provide at least 50 watt hours rated power for four hours a day or and, and uh, two hours in the night, uh, meaning minimum 200 watt hours of energy, and so on and so on, up until tier five, where you know where we are sitting today, where you have basically 24 hour uh, access to to electricity, and we are talking about you know very significant uh, consumptions, just like just like we have in the in the U.S. All right, so where we are. So if this is the scale, and we do know that you know, we have, uh, have uh, 1.1 billion people without access, and an additional uh, 1 billion with very poor grid access, well, where we are? Well, the good news is that tier one access right now uh, has approximately 40 million devices deployed. Um, if you're accounting for, you know, other non-brand devices, this is estimated to be around 80 million. And 80 million households, that's, that's actually a lot of people. So we are talking about, you know, three, 400 million people out of this slice of, of 1 billion who have access to tier one, like solar lanterns and, you know, very small devices. But, you know, we are believing that, all right, well, if you have, you know, uh, lighting for a few hours in the evening, that's not really energy access yet. So if you look at, you know, tier two access, which really starts, you know, at, at 11 watt, watts and above, then we see that we only have 1.8 million people with access. So it seems like that we have a huge scaling challenge if we are talking about off-grid access to these, to these billions of people. So we are saying the deployment needs to be scaled by more than a thousand fold. All right, so what if we, what if we just you know, did more of the same. I mean, it seems like that we have the technology to supply power. We have it for more than a hundred years. So it seems there is really no limitation to, to doing that. And if you look at this graph, it shows, you know, the level of access by income groups. And the interesting thing is that, you know, it pretty much spikes. So if you are making more than $3,000 a year, and I'm assuming everybody in this room is way above this category, you are with a very good chance have really good access to electricity. But what is the last time in your personal life encountered a blackout? That's the, that, that's the number of reliability we are talking, 
talking about. But once you start going down in terms of income, then you see that the number of people either off-grid or living in, in bad-grid households uh, starts raising very significantly. The reason for this is what we believe that everybody who could be economically supplied with today's technology has been already supplied. So whoever is sitting at the base of the pyramid has not been supplied because the current technology is not able to provide an economic way to, to reaching them. So what these off-grid communities look like? They are usually very rural, very sparse. You know, our, our main mode of electricity distribution, the power grid, does not really work if, if the loads are so distributed because, you know, the price is just becoming really high. And they are usually have very, very low purchasing power. We are talking about less than $2 a day. And uh, most of these people have virtually no access to conventional financial services like bank accounts and so on. Most of these transactions are going on in, in the uh, informal economy in terms of in, 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 in cash or more and more nowadays in, in mobile money. So doing more of the same doesn't provide more people with electricity. It seems like that new technologies and strategies are needed to, to scale deployment. Um, all right, well, you know, it seems like that there is some problem here, but why, why can't we fix utilities? I mean, it seems like that, you know, grid access work very well in, in most of the world, so it should work for this bottom one billion as well. And if you look at the utilities in sub-Saharan Africa, this is what you see here, that what is there on a, on a kilowatt hour basis, what is their operating expenditure, what is their capital expenditure, and what is the actual rate they are collecting payments. And you can see that out of the, I believe, 27 uh, Sub-Saharan African utilities, there is only two, the Seychelles and Uganda, who are actually able to cover their expenditures. That means 95% of them are losing money on every single kilowatt hour that they are selling. That is an extremely bad business model. This can be sustained for a while. Uh, you know, they can be bailed out by the governments. But this does not cover scaling. So, what if we did more of the same? It would be financially unsustainable. And once again, it seems like there is a need for new technologies and new strategies to, to increase deployment. All right, well, you know, what if the international community came together and, you know, picked up the bill, really supported these, these utilities, you know, financial aids were skyrocketing and, you know, increased several orders of magnitude and we were able to, you know, supply these 1.1 billion people, the same level of electricity that we are enjoying in the, in the developed countries on OECD average, using the same technology that we are using today. If we did that, as they are stepping through these different tiers of access, when they get to OECD average, we are talking about 3.7 gigatons of excess CO2 emissions. That is approximately 10% you know, of what we are emitting already today. That would be an absolute environmental catastrophe. We should be scaling back on carbon emissions, not you know, ramping it down. And you know, if we don't change our trajectory, if we don't change the technology, it seems like we, we have no better way of going about this. So, uh, to sum it up, the grand challenge, the way we see it, is that we have 3 billion people living in energy poverty and 1.1 billion of them without any access to electricity. People who could be supplied with electricity has already been supplied. 95% of utilities in Sub-Saharan Africa are, are losing money on every kilowatt hour they are selling. And solving energy access using today's technology would result in 3.7 gigatons of, of excess CO2 emissions. So we are talking about some really strong problems here. We don't believe that philanthropy would be able to scale to these levels. Philanthropy is, is an extremely important part of the picture, but we believe that only self-sustaining commercial enterprises are really able to tackle this challenge at scale. So uh, once we look at the actual numbers, only 1.8 million people have tier two access. So it seems like we need a really, we have a really clear need to increase deployment thousandfold using new technologies and new strategies. And this is where, where our competition uh, comes in. So let's see what, what solutions are, are existing today. And once again, please feel free if you have, if you have any questions. So this is, this is a state of the art today. So uh, very dense urban centers you know, are, are pretty much dominated by the grid. So these are 
this is what you are very familiar with, you know, very high population densities, very high purchasing power, uh, you know, the distances are very small, there is already a well built out uh, grid available. But as you start moving out to more dispersed communities, to lower purchasing power communities, then what you start seeing is that you know the, the the cost of the grid starts really skyrocketing. It is the reason that you know distribution systems are, are not really suitable to build a million dollar high voltage transmission line to supply six people out in the middle of a desert. So there must be there must be a better distribution mechanism. That's why currently mini grids are, are really dominating. These are more dispersed uh, local solutions that typically supply a smaller city, a smaller or bigger village, uh, something in that ballpark. Uh, and once we reach these really dispersed tiny huts, these extremely low population density rural areas, that's where these solar home systems and Pico PV products uh, become really dominant. So these have usually really high cost. You know, we are calculated around $5 per kilowatt hour. So very, very, very high cost compared to you know, what you may be used to. Uh, but, you know, there is no really any alternative right now. So people are actually still preferring to use that rather than to use kerosene and other conventional energy sources. So it seems like that this is, this is the optimal curve today, but you know, is it, is it fixed in stone? By no means. So we strongly believe that there are opportunities to improve this and you know, even to come up with, with the better solutions around the edges, to come up with hybrid solutions. Can we have interconnected solar home systems? Can we have mini grids that can be built from the bottom up? That poses a lot of you know, uh, business questions and for this audience a lot of technical questions about how, how to implement something like that. All right, so let's see what, what do people want. People don't want electrons. I know in the audience this is hard to bear, but nobody's paying for electrons that is coming out of the outlet. We want the services that this enables us. So uh, using a, a, a survey class, which is, which is an excellent center, uh, very much focused on, on energy access issues, uh, made a survey enough with populations that what are the services that they would desire and what are the services that would have the greatest social impact. So what do you see that you know the classical off-grid uh, uses like uh, off-grid um, room lighting appliances, televisions, smartphones, uh, mobile phone charging banks are really the the most popular products. But the ones that would have the the greatest social impact are more solar pumps, uh, refrigeration, uh, both agricultural and, and light commercial. Um, in this competition, we are very much focused on on both. So we would like to see market pool. We would like to see you know, products that don't need to be pushed on people, but people naturally want, just like you know, cell phones have spread all over the developing world very quickly. But we also would like to see solutions that you know, have a great social impact. Um, so where are we today? Um, lighting and phone charging uh, is the technology that most of these Pico solar products have already covered. These are uh, rather mature technologies. There are a lot of competitors in the field. The prices have converged quite a bit. Uh, the emerging technologies are where we see a lot of the new opportunities. We are talking mainly about super efficient TVs, tablets, super efficient fans, super efficient refrigerators. Uh, as a note, in, in the competition, we are not designing appliances. We are not expecting anybody you know, to, to reinvent the wheel and come up with a whole off-grid energy suit from scratch. Uh, we are providing uh, a lot of guidance on our website to existing resources, to existing off-grid appliances that are already, already in the space. So I would like to encourage once again to, to see our website. And on the horizon, we have a couple of new opportunities uh, appearing. Uh, on, on this graph, it, it is mentioning air conditioning and washing machines. But I would like to mention one more thing, productive uses. All those different ways people can use electricity to actually increase their own income. So this can range from wherever solar milling to solar welding, solar pumping, and you know, a wide variety of uses. It can be as simple as you know, lighting in addition to a conventional technology, or it can be you know, as complicated as welding, which is, which is a really high peak power uh, load from, from a technical standpoint. 
All right. Well, I'm sure everybody in the audience knows what happens if you start, you know, multiplying time with power. The problem is not really that we are unable to power a phone, an LED, or even a fridge 100 watts. The problem really starts rising when you look at how many hours do these devices run. So charging a phone is, is not a big deal. But if you want to have a fridge that's running not even 24 hours, but a simple 10 hours a day, then we are talking about 1,000 watt hours of uh, electricity to be supplied. Right now, most solar home systems are, are this is way above their, their capabilities. Most solar home systems don't even meet the tier two requirements, which was 200 watt hours, if, if you recall from, from the previous slide. So there is a clear need for a lot of innovation in, in the field of uh, power supply. So let's see how do people pay for something like that. I mentioned to you that you know, most of these people living off grid are currently making less than $2 a day. So how are we talking about them buying you know, fridges and the solar system and you know, all the benefits that in the developed world are, are considered somewhat luxurious to have solar powered appliances? Well, the conventional model is you know, good old cash. And they simply walk into a shop and they buy an appliance, a solar lantern, you know, a solar phone charger, or something that you know, uh, covers their needs. Well, the problem is, uh, if, you, if you dig deeper into research, is that uh, these uh, communities often have very, very dispersed income and very, very um, um, hard to manage. It, it comes at, at different times in different sums. So they may be able to pay you know, $300 on, on a given opportunity, but they may be unable to pay for, for a very long time. So cash transactions, you know, historically has been very difficult. Uh, collecting cash is even more difficult. There has been some um, quite good attempts by from the Grameen Bank and from others, but it, it, has, it has struggled a lot. The, the real innovation of the office space came when pay-as-you-go billing became available. Uh, I think many of you know that mobile money is, is living a renaissance in, uh, in, the, in the developing world. This basically means that the way you have airtime on your phone, uh, some companies made it available to transfer it between individuals. So basically, if you have a cell phone, now you have access to very basic financial services. Now you can send money to your mom. Now you can you know, pay for different goods or services using your phone, which is, which is a huge innovation because suddenly all these uh, you know, value streams that are deriving from modern financial services become available. A good example enabled by mobile money is pay-as-you-go billing. So basically what happens here is that uh, people pay a smaller deposit for a solar home system than they are paying as they are using the system. We are talking about usually 50 cents a day to $15 a month, so, so quite, quite low payments. Uh, but you know, over over a longer period of time, this accumulates to to the same amount of money we are talking about here, and that pays off, uh, you know, a solar home system. And you know, over time, they can gradually, you know, upgrade their system and buy more appliances and buy a higher end system. And if you look at at the end of the day, I think this was, uh, you know. Don't, don't look at the hard numbers because these are just to tell a story. But uh, over a five year period, we are talking about more than three times more payments if a pay as you go billing system is used as opposed to a conventional uh, cash based billing. All right, uh, and one final note on technology is that if you think about it, most grid tied appliances are extremely energy inefficient. And the simple reason being is that electricity is so cheap. So if you just hope in a copy-paste model that, okay, you take a, a TV manufacturer from the US or Europe or you know, Asia and uh, try to sell their products in, say, Sub-Saharan Africa or India or Papua New Guinea, you're going to have a really bad time because those appliances are designed to run off a grid and therefore are not really working hard to save energy. If you invest you know, marginally to get more energy efficient appliances, or you know, as, as a current trend today, you invest very significantly to, to get energy efficient appliances. That actually pays off in the long term because you don't have to oversize the system to accommodate these, uh, these appliances. So we see that uh, energy efficiency is a key in, in off-grid energy access. All right, so how all this comes together, uh, 
the, this problem, what are the, the challenges it is uh, providing? We talked a little bit. Well, what are the opportunities that we are going to see from this? And Dr. Devan is going to talk about that. Any questions? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, you mentioned that the pay as you go is about like 50 cents a day. That would be about 25% of their income. Uh, you mentioned in that case, what, is that a reasonable estimate? How much are they using now? Yeah, ac excellent question. Um, 50 cents is what <laughs> most older and bigger uh, off-grid companies are using. Uh, it is really hard to gauge what are the actual numbers that people are paying. This, this number was coming from uh, people spending around you know, 40 cents for, so, or so for kerosene lamps. So for the kerosene that they are using to fuel that, that lamps, which is an extremely inefficient you know, mode of lighting plus extremely, uh, extremely uh, air polluting. So to, to beat a kerosene lamp, that's a fine price point. If you start stepping up, and you know, as we saw, if you start using fridges and fans and some appliances that have a much higher energy, probably 50 cents is going to be very excessive. So um, right now, I, I heard some people saying that we are talking about six cents per day is something that everybody can afford. So in, in, in either cases, what we are seeing, it has to be orders of magnitude lower than what you know we are usually used to in uh, in in developed country businesses. Thank you. Right. Any other questions? Yes, please. Um, <clears throat> you have mentioned that uh, ninety five percent of the sub-Saharan uh, continent are not utility companies are not being able to recover their cost, their capital cost. Yeah. Uh, could you mention the main reason behind that? In that's, a, that's an excellent question. My take is that um, these electricity prices are having subsidized and usually it's the government that is providing access to you know, areas that are, cannot be profitably served using the grid by just covering the cost and basically spreading it over the entire population in form of tax. Do you have uh, yeah. yeah. I think the second uh, thing is that uh, the population densities in many of those areas tends to be low as well. Uh, and I think uh, conventional electricity access is probably good in urban settings uh, where the population density is higher. But when you get out into the, uh, into the boonies, I think it becomes much harder to, to recover the cost. And yet, that's the only mechanism that we know of delivering power. Even in the U.S., when you're delivering power to rural communities or small communities, somebody's social, you know, it, it's a social write-off in terms of, uh, of cost. And I think, you know, when, you know, you're in a place where the overall affordability is poor, I think it becomes much more uh, can you give us an idea of the uh, average income level of this 1.1 uh, this, uh, billion population? So 2,000 US dollar per year, 1,000 US dollar per year, roughly? We are talking about um, the, the poverty line is defined as 1.9 dollar per day. So we are talking about 700 bucks a year. So extremely, extremely uh, low amounts. This is, this is why this uh, bottom of the pyramid uh, markets has really lived as a, as a revolution where people really started thinking about how can you, uh, you know, rethink business models. Our business models have been based on, look at Apple, to sell, you know, really high-end devices to a really small population. <coughs> so you can afford spending, you know, five bucks on advertising. You can afford, you know, uh, $10 in distribution. But when you're talking about, you know, such, such extremely low purchasing power populations, but their numbers are extremely high. So you have to come up with a brand new business model where you can sustain a, a distribution model, for example, that is able to reach you know, so many people. I mean, coming back to the, the, the real cost, if we are talking about you know, six cents per transaction, that's probably the ballpark where banks are charging right now for a transaction. That's obviously not a viable model for, uh, for emerging markets. I think one more thing to kind of uh, keep in mind, I think, up till now, we've kind of made it, you know, we, you, you're either a producer or a consumer, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, so we make and somebody buys. What we are seeing in this market is that when we address their living needs, we should also address their livelihood. We have to address and make them more efficient. So the energy needs to go in and become a part of, you know, ha helping them earn more money so that this virtuous cycle can be started. So everything we see, this is why tier two is important. Otherwise, you give them a light and you're done your job, right? But it doesn't get them out of that circle of party.
Any other questions? All right. Well, the next the next session is going to be handled by Dr. Huh? All right. So, All right. right. Well, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, and thank you very much for the questions. I think uh, uh, this is, uh, is is actually uh, uh, very, very encouraging uh, to see this. So, as as we kind of went through this whole process of uh, um, you know kind of figuring out what the challenges were, uh, we actually uh, you know held uh, a workshop uh, in uh, in Georgia Tech uh, in November 2016. Uh, we had representation from uh, the World Bank, from uh, you know major corporations, NGOs, USAID. Everybody had come. And we kind of looked at this whole issue of scaling. I think the biggest problem is scaling. I don't think it's a technology issue. And I think the conclusion from that workshop was the same thing. It was not a technology issue. Uh, and, 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 you know, really had to kind of look at solutions that could scale by this thousandfold number that, uh, that Zillar just uh, uh, talked about. So, I mean, I think, you know, let's kind of keep that in mind as we uh, are, are, are looking at, uh, at the solutions. Um, and uh, what we kind of, you know, wanted to start off off with, I mean, we are a room full of electrical engineers. You know, we have done a marvelous job. I mean, in fact, if you think about it, you know, the electrical grid is, is really phenomenal. I mean, you walk into a room and you turn on the switch and you don't even think about the fact is the light going to be on or, uh, or not? Uh, and this technology has been optimized over 100 plus years, right? So it uh, can't get any better than that. And it doesn't, you know, when we, you know, kind of look at uh, the constraints that we, uh, we have uh, out here. But I think I just want to raise a couple of questions because this may uh, allow us to begin to frame how to think about this. Because, you know, when I, when I look at it, the technology community that has not really focused on this issue because we don't view it as being high tech and we're really focused on developing high tech solutions. So let's just take a look at this, right? Utility models were developed 100 plus years ago. We had a grid, a national grid working well before microprocessors and DSPs were ever there or PMUs were ever there and it worked very well. Okay, and uh, this was mechanical governor controls and uh, did a very, very good job of uh, providing energy for everybody. So how can you improve on that? Well, today we have dynamic controls. Okay, can dynamic controls play a role in terms of how systems of the future can be, uh, be put together? Okay, today's model is you put a huge investment in, uh, in generation uh, and uh, TND infrastructure. Okay, uh, and uh, that's fine when you have lots of money to spare. When you're in, in an impoverished country in uh, very poor communities, you know, can you afford to do that? Is that the right model by which you uh, scale and, uh, and develop? Uh, so, I mean, can we do build as needed? Okay, uh, in, the, in the past, that's not been economical, but maybe today the, uh, the, uh, the story is going to be, uh, be different. Okay, I mean, you know, I mean, again, you built large utilities and you had, uh, you know, economies at very large scale. You had generation plants that were in the hundreds of megawatts or, uh, or, or gigawatt level. You had transmission at, uh, you know, hundreds of kilovolts. Uh, and uh, you had a very complex operating procedure in terms of integrated resource planning. Uh, you had large control centers that were trying to optimize everything, uh, you know, dynamically. And you had uh, trained people. I can't go to a village in Malawi and expect to duplicate that in, uh, in any way. Okay, so how do you kind of, uh, you know, run the system so the intelligence is now in a box uh, and the system manages itself? These are all technology issues as far as, uh, you know, I'm, I'm able to, uh, to see this. Okay, what came out of this economies of scale? I mean, we went uh, from Edison's time where he had a generation plant in each house, okay, to, uh, to very large generation, uh, you know, outside. And it's mainly because we were able to get uh, you know, low cost of, uh, uh, of, uh, of electricity. I mean, we're seeing 10, uh, 10 cents a kilowatt hour uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, you know, for residential consumers and uh, even lower, five to six cents a kilowatt hour for some commercial, uh, you know, consumers. So the question is, can we deliver that at small scale? And if you can, you might be able to change the paradigm in terms of lower investments uh, as, you, as you go into it. Uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, the cost of uh, delivering power you know, from central generation poor uh, communities uh, at the edge is quite high. So can you reduce the amount of TND build? Uh, and uh, if you can use decentralized resources, that may end up, uh, you know, providing uh, one way to cut the cost out. You can see, I'm, I'm systematically trying to put things in place that says that, okay, here's the model, it's worked well. Now, when we change the target, you know, customer base and we change the technology that, you know, can be deployed and is available, you know, uh, does something else uh, happen? Um, you know, in, in the old days, there was no way to uh, dynamically change pricing. 
So we played, uh, paid uh, flat rates and flat tariffs. Okay, is that true today? I mean, can we dynamically, uh, you know, change the price level? Because think about it, if you build a community with very uh, high amount of solar energy, which is very, very cheap, when the sun is shining, the cost of energy should be very low. And when the sun is not shining uh, and you're running off batteries or a diesel, the cost should be high. And you should be able to, you know, m you know manage that uh, dynamically uh, and, uh, and be able to squeeze the most out of the system. And if you could do that, you might be able to kind of, uh, you know, get a system that is, uh, is working, uh, working better. Another thing that we have used to out here is, I don't care. Give me high reliability. Give me high resiliency. When it doesn't cost me anything, I want to demand everything. Okay, but you know, if you're, if you're in a small village, uh, you know, in India or uh, in, in Africa, and you have nothing, okay, having two hours of light a day is already an improvement. So, I mean, I think I want to recalibrate what, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the whole question of service level is. You know, how much of overbuild of assets are you willing to, uh, you know, willing to accommodate, uh, you know, to be able to uh, get the, uh, uh, you know, get the service level that you desire. You know, in the, in, in the new paradigm, if I want that same level of reliability for every megawatt a solar plant, I have to put a megawatt of gas generation plant, okay? Uh, and that just does not, uh, the economics just does not work, right? So, so I think we need to kind of recalibrate. I mean, in every other sphere of life, you pay attention to cost. If you want to, uh, you know, if you want to have convenience, you buy a car, uh, you know, otherwise uh, you, uh, you know, you, you, you take a taxi or a bus or a train. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a difference in cost, a difference in level of service. Uh, and in electricity, we just have not had that. Uh, and uh, I think that's part of, uh, part of the challenge, okay? So what is the best opportunity, you know, around this? I mean, it must be, you know, clear to, to people here, uh, is, uh, is really what we are calling exponential technologies. These are technologies where the cost uh, of, uh, you know, of, of uh, uh, a service has been going down exponentially. I mean, so if you look at solar, okay, solar has been going down. Uh, we call it a learning rate. The learning rate for uh, solar is uh, is about 26% per year, and that has been going on for almost 30 years. It just didn't start recently. You know, uh, solar costs have been going on, going down 26% uh, per year for 30 years, uh, and we can start seeing that here. You can see that uh, uh, the price of solar is now starting to approach, uh, uh, you know, grid parity across many parts of the U.S. I mean, just uh, last year uh, we saw, uh, no, this year, early this year, uh, we saw in Mexico 1.7 cents a kilowatt hour uh, at uh, at a at a utility farm level uh, on a 20-year contract. That is phenomenally low in terms of uh, the price of solar. A wind has been doing something similar out here. And so that's, 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 that's base generation technology, of course. Okay, but I mean, the problem with both of these is they are extremely uh, variable. And you cannot count on them being there when you want them to. So the, the straight line answer is let's put more storage. Okay, well, that's not necessarily the right answer because then the cost advantages uh, of this uh, are lost. Okay, so the way we think about this is that it's not just so solar and wind that are exponential technologies, but these are based on, on, on other exponential trends that have been going on for a long time. Okay, computation is one, you know, PV and solar, a wind. Power semiconductors, they've been on an exponential decline for the last 25 years, okay, and continue to go. So, so at the heart of uh, power conversion is really this, and this is part of it. Energy storage, yes. Microcontrollers, okay. Uh, and, you know, you can get a 50 cent microcontroller that can do everything that would take a hundred dollar microprocessor uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, uh, other elements around it. Uh, you know, 20 years back. Communication technologies. I mean, uh, Zillard talked about pay as you go. What does pay as you go really mean? Because you have a local place where you need to make a decision on whether amount of payment has been done or not and allow them to get light services, for instance, or other services. Okay, that needs to communicate back somewhere to a cloud, to a payment. So there's a whole chain that gets defined as soon as you start talking about this. So it's all technology. I mean, this is what it is, right? I mean, to solve these hard problems for the lowest, uh, you know, paying uh, customers, the only way ar around that is really to use these exponential technologies, which are all 21st century technologies. So they have to be integrated together in a very cost-effective way. The populations are there. This allows you to deliver service at a cost point that was just not possible 10, even 10 years back. 
Okay, so this is the brave new world, and I think this is kind of what uh, this competition is really trying to uh, uh, to tap into. Okay, includes online services, includes social media, includes mobile pay, includes things like blockchain. Because every time transactions have to be done, guess what? The most creative people in terms of breaking the systems are probably living there. Okay, in the same communities that you're trying to service. So you know you must have uh, uh, the best uh, in terms of uh, security uh, baked into uh, into these things as well. So here's some opportunities that we think for innovation. Okay, um, new business models. Okay, if I have a solar light and I can figure out a way to cost effectively do micropayments and secure the device and do device tracking. Okay, man, I mean that might actually work very well. Okay, so we're now talking of integrating all these two or three new technologies all into the same thing, okay, uh, and, uh, and make this uh, happen. So, yes, it could be new service models, you know, so instead of purchase, you have a service model. It could be lease, could be billing, uh, it could be microfinance. I mean, we've talked about uh, these things uh, before. The second thing is, how do you scale it? So, you know, in, uh, in my last company at, uh, at Verintech, uh, we had these little devices that we put on a pole top to do volt for, uh, you know, compensation, okay? And uh, because there was a decentralized control, uh, we had to do centralized uh, kind of optimization and data gathering. That communication link was the weakest chain in the whole system, okay? And the cost of that was astronomical. And then when we wanted to go to Canada, it was go going to cost me uh, a quarter million dollars just to get it certified for use in Canada. Oh, and by the way, three years after that, they were going to change the communications technology. Okay, so, so this is the kind of a, a real hassle that, uh, that kind of happens as you start looking at scalability. So how do you define, you know, design things that are scalable? Uh, because, you know, if you, if you have to deliver that service to 100 people, it may be very expensive on a per capita basis. But if I can do that for 10 million people or 50 million people, okay, then, you know, the enterprise, the enterprise can make some money out of that. Uh, and so if you have to have a huge IT staff and huge customization to be able to do that, okay, this isn't going to work very well. We should be looking at carbon neutral footprints. I mean, I think that is, uh, you know, and all these technologies that are coming out really seem to, uh, to afford that. Uh, expandability. Why do you want to erect a Taj Mahal before uh, the person out there can afford it? If the person can only afford to spend uh, for a 10 watt system, give him a 10 watt system and stack onto it as uh, his needs grow uh, or as the community needs grow. So there's a whole new way to think about expandability uh, and keeping the economic constraints in mind. And it's really all driven in our, in our mind by technology and, and nothing else. Okay, uh, distribution is a huge piece of it. How do you get a service into an area where uh, the population density is low and the, uh, the competence level is very low? You know, how do you, how do you get, that, uh, get that to work? And then, if I need to have a PhD out there tuning loops to get this thing to work, that isn't a reasonable way of, uh, of doing it, okay? Uh, and then, you know, the whole installation, the commissioning, the servicing, you know, these costs work in high value environments, uh, but they do not work very well in low value environments. The other thing is, okay, what happens at the end of life? Okay, the, already there's a mountain of uh, e-waste starting to develop in, uh, you know, in, in Africa and uh, in other places because solar lanterns don't last. Okay, and they get thrown out. Batteries don't last, they get thrown out. I mean, so this problem needs to be, uh, be addressed as well. Data analytics, huge. Okay, I mean, if you can start collecting data from the millions and billions of devices being deployed, okay, you can kind of figure out economies uh, in, in, in overall uh, uh, and how to do it. Okay, but how do you get data from there back and how do you kind of uh, close the loop on uh, the various stakeholders? Okay, uh, critically important. The more the people get included into digital and financial services, the better their life improves and the better their ability to pay and get more services you know, improves. I mean, so we had a financial services company who attended our first workshop. We said, why the hell are you guys out here? And I said, you know, we are expanding into these areas and our biggest challenge is to figure out how good of a credit risk a certain person is. If we can get the data that says that they're making good on their micropayments, they are a good credit risk and will fund them to get their new business established and to, you know, and that starts the upward cycle. So this is the kind of stuff we're talking about where we say that. Um, device monitoring, critically important. How well is the battery doing? Is it being abused? Is, you know, now all of that information, if it's available, you can kind of maximize the utility that they get out of it, right? Um, and then regional empowerment. And then finally, I think one of the things we think is the creativity that people have is just phenomenal. 
Uh, and we cannot even begin to anticipate the types of solutions that people will come in when you give them a wide landscape you know, to kind of uh, innovate in. And so, you know, we're kind of very actively looking for the wow factor, you know, the really the disruptive game changers that we think will come from anywhere. It could come from uh, from India. We have a word, we say jugard out there, which means, you know, uh, you know, kind of uh, a frugal uh, engineering, you know, kind of linked with uh, uh, something that is highly disruptive. So, you know, that that's the kind of stuff that uh, we are, are seeing out here. So that's kind of the background for the competition. Let me kind of walk you guys through uh, what the uh, competition itself uh, is, uh, is, is kind of looking like, right? So uh, we've been through a number of uh, you know, cycles out here. Many of the people out here have been involved with uh, kind of conceptualizing this, uh, this competition. Uh, the IEEE Power Electronics Society has taken a leadership position out here. We're trying to draw everybody else uh, into it right now. Uh, and uh, it's, it's uh, you know, we, we started off saying this is just a one-off event, but we looked at it and said, this is too big uh, a thing to kind of uh, take in one chunk. Um, and so what we are now looking at is, uh, it's really going to be a recurring competition, most likely a biennial competition, uh, with, uh, you know, starting, this is the first year that we're kind of running this. It's a two-year cycle. Uh, so we go through, uh, you'll see that, uh, a set of regional rounds in, in year one, uh, leading to a global competition, a global final uh, in, uh, in year two. Okay? Uh, and the idea was that we wanted to kind of uh, create a platform where people from all over could get together and, you know, crowdsource, uh, you know, innovation. We think that Flavors are extremely important because every region has different set of problems, different set of uh, constraints, and different ways that people think about it. The needs are different, so that uh, that uh, regional uh, kind of flavor is very important. Uh, and the focus is really to accelerate uh, the deployment and scaling of energy access uh, solutions. So, you know, we define the goal of the competition. You know, it's interdisciplinary in nature. The innovation is really important. It's a global uh, kind of uh, approach to this. Uh, and the idea is to develop and demonstrate solutions for energy access that are designed to scale. Scaling is critical, are regionally relevant, are holistic. So this can't be, I have a better control loop. Okay, that control loop has to be embedded in, you know, how the service can actually be delivered and how it becomes, uh, becomes important. Uh, and, it can and it really leverages 21st century technologies that are really built on exponentially declining prices. So this is kind of the heart of the competition in terms of what the expectation is uh, that people are going to be doing. If there are any questions, please uh, feel free to, uh, you know, to, to raise a hand and ask. So, so what are the solutions that we're going to be looking for here? Okay, so the proposed solutions really come back to um, it should be delivering a service, as Szilard said, nobody's looking for electrons. Right, so what is that service? Okay, so it should include this entire you know, system of power generation, delivery and management including the physical, technical, social, and business elements ne needed to operate the system sustainably. Okay, so as, you, as you're developing a solution, we want you to pay attention to the fact, how is it going to be distributed? How is it going to be maintained? How is it going to uh, be paid for? You know, what is it triggering in terms of social interaction? What is it triggering in terms of livelihood improvements? What, you know, all of those things really need to be, uh, be there. The second thing is, you know, uh, as Zillard said, you know, we've kind of uh, worked on already quite a bit on getting uh, tier one access. Solar lanterns are going on, uh, and uh, you know, there's still a lot that needs to be done. Okay, but at least uh, you know, there's a lot of progress being made in that uh, in that space. But in tier two, there's virtually nothing that has been done. And that's where the real virtuous cycle starts. So in a sense, you know, what we are saying, and you know, we've been working very closely with the World Bank and with SMAP and others, and they're all excited about uh, the approach that, uh, you know, that uh, we've uh, worked on and, and we worked it, you know, evolved it with them, okay, is, okay, let's kind of look at tier two access, 50 watts per day, uh, moving up to 200, uh, you know, and, you know and, and 200 watt hours per day. Uh, and uh, this kind of begins to get people that, do they have to be at that level day one? No, but whatever solution they have should be able to grow into that uh, and then to grow on, uh, you know, further and fill, fulfill their needs as, they, uh, as, uh, as the family becomes uh, more able to afford that, right? The competition does not cover the design of new generation sources or appliances. So if there's a better 
better solar cell you've developed or if there's a better device you've developed, that's not within the scope, although it can be a part of an overall system design. So if your overall system is better because that is integrated in, that's fine, that's not a problem. But, uh, you, know, they, you know, it's not really about the design of appliances uh, or, uh, you know, or sources. Um, Okay, so again, let's take a look uh, at where we are and what we think uh, is the transition that we're, we're talking about. So this is no access, uh, this is energy delivered, and this is uh, peak power uh, that the, uh, the rating is. So tier one is really sitting kind of, uh, you know, out here. Okay, it's just lighting mainly and cell phones. Okay, uh, and what we are now talking about is kind of making this migration. We want people to be moving along that axis uh, and, uh, and going out there. So we've defined, in a, in a sense, uh, two, two types of families. Okay, one is a low energy use family and the other one is a high energy use family. Um, and, uh, you know, what we are, are, are saying is that the low energy use families, where you kind of start off out here, okay, uh, 50 watts, 200 watt hours, up to 120 watts, 500 watt hours, and it migrates up to 130 watts, 700 watt hours, and 200 watts, 1000 watt hours. That takes you along this, uh, this journey. Uh, one thing to remember, this is a f discussion on family, but it really also includes the community. Okay, and whatever solutions we're talking about out here need to address the needs of both the family and the community, which tells you that there are two ways to think about the problem. Okay, you can kind of start off from a top down in a traditional utility uh, design fashion, whether it's a microgrid or a nano grid or a full grid, doesn't matter. And we're seeing some very innovative, uh, you know, technologies being deployed. For instance, I mean, uh, cell towers are everywhere now. Uh, and cell towers are being, you know, kind of used as, uh, as microgrids from where you can run a, uh, a small distribution line into a community and power them. Okay, so that's a very innovative and a very uh, novel way of, uh, of achieving multiple functions. Uh, and there's some, some good reason to kind of think, uh, think like that. So, you know, w the target customer is now very well defined here. So we have two sets of requirements here. One is at the community level and one is at the individual home level. Okay, so the proposed set of products or services have to meet the customer's growing needs. Okay, this is really important and is very different from the way we think about it. Today, we think about affluent communities as being there. Uh, and uh, as people get more affluent, they buy more things, but there's always a market. But in these communities, you start off with very little purchasing power. Okay, at that point in time, your business model is not generating enough revenue. So if you have a re really big capital investment that you had to make and you're not getting enough revenue at that point in time, this is a really tough business model to develop. Okay, and so you have to address that, that, that whole question. If I'm going to put a whole utility distribution infrastructure in place, okay, yes, technically it'll work, not a problem, but are you going to be able to show economic viability? I guess that's one of the reasons why the sub-Saharan African utilities are not succeeding because the customers really are not able to pay uh, at, uh, at the start of, uh, of this. So what is the target community uh, out here? I mean, and so, so this family starts at a tier two level and may grow over several years, uh, you, know, uh, you know, to upper tier two levels of, uh, of consumption, okay? And we need to look at the target household and the target community. So what is the target community? These are small communities. They are the hardest to serve. Urban areas, not so difficult to serve, okay? Uh, yes, the challenge out there too, but this is really, I think, the heart of the challenge, right? So 20 to 1,000 homes per community, averaging purchase, purchasing power of uh, $1,500 per year per household. Currently, they're either off-grid completely or have very few solar lanterns once in a while that they get, uh, and, uh, and that's about it, okay? Uh, the government promises a grid. If at best it's going to be a poor grid, and it's not going to be well connected. Uh, I think Zillard mentioned, uh, you know, that uh, you get get one, uh, you know, home in the uh, village is uh, lighted, and they count the whole village is being lit. Um, target uh, communities are mostly residential and agricultural. There may be commercial and light uh, manufacturing uh, activities, uh, and they're looking to transition as a whole to a community with a higher level of uh, income. Uh, and then 50% of the households don't have bank accounts, and 30% uh, have sm uh, smartphones. So you can see it's a very different mix of uh, community. Uh, it looks like a very different community from what we are uh, accustomed to, uh, to out here. And then here's the target household. Okay, five people, two parents under 40 years of age, okay, three, three young kids, um, no formal education, no crafts training, 
Okay, this is typical, but you know, if you can get them into a craft, uh, you know, certainly their ability to earn an income increases quite, uh, quite dramatically. They speak a, a regional language, and uh, we already talked about the average income. And uh, we'll all chuckle and say that child labor is not allowed, but I think one of the first, uh, you know, kind of proposals that we started seeing, you know, actually involves something that looked like child labor. So I think it's good to have this uh, saying that no, no child labor is uh, is allowed. Um, so here's kind of what the uh, low energy use family looks like. Uh, you know, and this is kind of where we expect them to start uh, and uh, and move up here. Uh, so, 200 watt hours a day, 50 watts for uh, you know peak power, four hours a day, two hours per night. You must meet lighting and phone charging. Okay, so what does that mean? It means maybe it's a three watt light for uh, you know four to uh, you know six hours per uh, per day. Uh, maybe a couple of lights uh, and and cell phone charging is is very very important. And then digital inclusion means you know either it's a tablet or it's a, you know TV or it's some some form of connectivity back uh, because that you know starts getting them ramped up in uh, you know overall. The, fiman the, the family is very constrained financially uh, and uh, you know uses funds when they are available. Okay, that's why the pay as you go is very important, different business models are very important, and the technology that allows you to deliver those business models in a cost-effective way is very important. Okay, so this is, I think, part of what we're talking about. And then this migrates up as their, their performance and their, their ability to get income increases, uh, you know, and you start seeing appliances and productivity kind of uh, beginning to, uh, you know, show up out there. Family aspirations are really uh, extremely important. Uh, productivity and community services are very important. Okay, so I mean, you know, whether it's lighting, whether it's graining, whether it's water pumping, with you know, all these are community services that benefit everybody. Okay, and uh, that model needs to be kind of integrated in, uh, you know, with that uh, as uh, as well. So, so what are some of the desirable attributes that we are we are targeting? So, one of the things that we are very kind of focused on is that as, uh, the competition is agnostic completely. To, uh, to energy sources, to technology, to business models, and we want to have as wide a tent as possible out here to attract people who can kind of think very creatively about what could make this uh, actually, uh, you know, you know, work. Uh, and the assessment's really going to be based on, uh, you know, the impact, the ability to rapidly and sustainably scale, uh, you know, and, and what is the ability to kind of uh, get to a billion people eventually, which is, would be really, uh, you know, phenomenal. So, so what are the you know, desirable features here? Holistic, we keep hearing the word holistic, it's really important, integrates the, uh, the technology, the business, and the social aspect of, uh, you know, of uh, whatever is uh, planned for uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, a solution, okay? And it must be uh, designed to scale. Okay, and that's scaling. So as soon as we start putting a stress test on a solution and, and say, okay, what happens when it gets to a thousand people? What happens when it gets to a hundred thousand people? What happens when it gets to a ten million people? Okay, you start seeing, you know, how this thing is starting to uh, become, you know, challenging. The costs are starting to spiral out of control in areas where you didn't think this was going to be uh, be the case. Includes a business plan, you know, not necessarily in the first round, uh, you know, and that's detailed, but certainly by the time you get to uh, regional and final rounds, you know, we expect to see a better and better business plan out there and it needs to address the base of the pyramid so it needs to address this this population that is not able to uh, pay a lot right now but hopefully can you know can ramp up uh, it integrates as you, as needed communications, Pago, cybersecurity, microfinance. Not everything needs it, but I mean to be able to deliver this kind of solution. You know, if it needs it, then it should be kind of at least talking to it and saying, okay, this is how it's going to be integrated in. Um, it needs to be economically viable for small communities. Okay, uh, it needs to address uh, a challenge of managing a fleet of large number of devices. So if I'm saying I'm going to deliver 100,000 devices out there in the field, okay, am I going to manage them? You you know, can I get system optimization out of coordination? Do I do pay go? How do I do that? I mean, all of that is kind of part of what you're thinking about here. Um, addresses, uh, you know, new income generation opportunities because that really allows you to get that scaling piece uh, in there. Um, one thing that we saw was really important was this whole thing of external stakeholders. Okay, if I can get a finance company to pick up part of the cost because they're getting part of the benefit, then it makes this economically viable. So you're kind of looking across it and then finally uses carbon neutral technologies, right? Um, so here's how the competition is going. Okay, so we have essentially uh, three rounds out, there, out here. Uh, the online round is started already on May 1st. And uh, you're, uh, you know, welcome to uh, log on to the website. Uh, it's uh, empowerabillionlives.org. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, you will, uh, you know, you can, uh, you know, look at all the information. There's a detailed competition guide out there. Uh, there's a whole process of how you, uh, you know, uh, you know, kind of submit your applications and everything else. Uh, that's all, all going on. Um, you know, good news is uh, we already have uh, 120 teams that are now registered uh, from across the globe. Uh, and uh, we're hoping uh, that this process is just going to build up. Um, how many people are here from a university? We hope to see a team from every university participating in this. We have special uh, kind of uh, incentives uh, for, uh, for student teams. I mean, this is something, you know, they can get excited about, they can get really inspired by, uh, and uh, you have all the resources available in the school in terms of business uh, people and others who can come together and, uh, and, and, uh, and participate in this, in this competition. Um, so the, the online round, we'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, ends at the end of August, uh, and then it moves to a regional round, okay? And there are five regional uh, competitions that are, are scheduled right now. Uh, one is uh, in South Asia in Chennai, one is in Pacific Asia in Shenzhen, uh, one is in Africa in Johannesburg in, uh, in Europe in Sevilla, uh, and uh, for the Americas in, uh, in Puerto Rico. And these are all taking place uh, towards the end of this year and the beginning of next year. Okay, uh, and uh, the idea is that uh, uh, each of these regional uh, competitions, you know, will have a presentation, like a Shark Tank presentation, in front of a panel of judges. Uh, they will have uh, the ability to, uh, you know, defend their uh, their presentation. And those who are selected, uh, you know, will get resources uh, and prize money, uh, and will get resources to get ready for a field test. Okay, so they're going to, you know, uh, take the units they've built and demonstrated uh, and, uh, you know, kind of demonstrate them uh, in a target community that is very similar to the one that we're targeting out here. Uh, and to demonstrate uh, that it's going to work, uh, a, 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 you know, panel of judges will actually go to the field site and, and will look at the thing working. There will be independent data that will be taken to make sure that it's all okay. And this will then uh, come together into a, a final round in, uh, in, uh, in September 2019, I don't know why it says November 2019, right, uh, at uh, ECCE uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Baltimore uh, in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, we have a lot of uh, IEEE volunteers that are actually participating in this and thank you so much for that this is a labor of love but uh, you know it's also the beginning of something that is you know really exciting from a technology perspective because it's kind of talking about the integration of all these technologies to deliver solutions that uh, you know will make a really big difference uh, and that is the motive for IEEE and that is certainly the motive of engineering is to uh, develop solutions that uh, that impact uh, humanity okay so you know, here are the tracks for the competition. There are two fundamental tracks uh, that we're talking about. Okay, one is decentralized model and a centralized model. So what does that really mean? So the centralized model is a typical microgrid model today or a top-down utility model today, okay, uh, where uh, it's centrally planned, implemented power generation distribution, offering course and service at the community level. So this one's more community focused in terms of a top-down design, okay, uh, and uh, uh, it is essentially, uh, you know, uh, taking, uh, 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 you know, uh, the type of uh, technology you're using to deliver service, it's, this could include, uh, you know, what the generation sources, what the balancing sources, uh, you know, what distribution automation you're using, what, uh, uh, you know, AMI you're using, you know, all of those things can be kind of part, part of it. But you have to really be able to show that from a cost perspective, this is being effective, okay, to serve this community that can really maybe not spend a lot of money to begin with uh, and whose expenditure, you know, capability will grow with, uh, with time. Uh, and the second is really I think uh, probably more challenging at this point in time, but you know, probably more interesting is a decentralized model where the system is created from the bottom up, where every home can essentially have a solution uh, that uh, meets its current requirements and where you can, you know, just interconnect that network of homes uh, and, uh, you know, and, and then create a community, okay, where the, uh, the investments grow as the need grows, okay, but how do you operate a system like that? What is the market model for that? You know, how is the billing done? How is uh, security done? How is There's a whole bunch of different challenges that, uh, you know, come out uh, you know, from that. 
And interestingly enough, we think this is, you know, sounds like science fiction, okay, because, you know, I don't see many papers out here that address that, but there are companies now that are actually offering products like that, okay? So if we don't begin to kind of address those issues in the technical domain, you know, we'll get to the point where industry is, you know, ahead of, uh, uh, you know, of, uh, of, uh, of the technology community. That's not very good either. Now, in that, again, we have two subtracts. So for each of them, you know, the commercially available solutions, you know, they have a much lower hurdle in terms of demonstrating because they just have to show what they're doing and give data. Uh, we validate that and it's done. And then emerging solutions, which again can be companies participating, labs participating, uh, or, uh, or, or academia participating, uh, where uh, you know, uh, they, they, they have to kind of demonstrate, uh, you know, develop the, uh, the devices uh, if needed uh, or interconnect them if needed. So you can kind of do this in multiple ways and we'll talk about that. But this is the model essentially where we are uh, kind of uh, looking at how to, uh, uh, you know, how, how, how the competition is going to be, uh, be organized. So the submission process is this way. Uh, the online round, the team essentially uh, begins to explore this, forms a hypothesis of what the proposed submission is, okay, identifies what the novelty is, uh, you know, understand the competencies needed, identify gaps in your uh, uh, team members and locate them, okay, uh, build a team as needed, uh, define the steps in completion of tasks associated with the competition, write the online proposal, record a video uh, that uh, we, we encourage people to do, a two to three minute video, uh, and then uh, select the round location and track and submit. So pretty straightforward process. It's, uh, we've seen 120 teams now already respond to that, so that's, that's really good. Um, after the online round is completed, uh, we really want to use this more to make sure that people who are completely uh, misaligned with the, uh, the, the goal of the competition, uh, you know, are discouraged from, uh, you know, participating in the regional round. Uh, so the people will be invited to participate in the regional round. They define the timeline of tasks, design or procure devices and compo you know, components, assemble, build prototype systems, okay, test in the lab or control setting, validate against target, and prepare presentation demonstration for regional round okay so this is kind of the starting point and we'll talk more about uh, the field tests uh, you know uh, at some later point in time we understand that uh, not the teams may or may not have all the resources that are required and all the competencies that are required. So we've been working to try to make some of these new technology competencies available. So if you want to kind of approach the project and uh, the competition from a different perspective, okay, you can par you know, partner with some of these people and, uh, and, and take the solutions and integrate those with, uh, with what you have, or you can do it yourself. Uh, so you know, we're also trying to you know, create opportunities for what we call mashup, where you can kind of uh, talk to other team members and other potential people who might be interested uh, because you don't have all the competencies that you're looking for uh, within your own, uh, own team. Um, you know, we've been told that uh, this is really an extremely hard process. Uh, you know, um, USAID told us that, the World Bank told us that, uh, IFC told us that, but they all said this needs to be done. Okay, so, you know, we're happy to be leading the charge. We'll stumble, we'll fall occasionally, but uh, that's all right. This is a very good uh, initiative and we're, you know, happy to be kind of uh, doing that. What is the, uh, how are we going to evaluate this? Let's take a look at that. So, we've uh, come up with uh, a judging uh, rubric and we've uh, talked with a lot of people out of energy access and the technology area uh, to come up with uh, how this evaluation, uh, you know, should be, uh, should be done. Uh, and uh, we'll be sharing this uh, rubric with the reviewers uh, and the judges, uh, you know, and uh, the idea is to provide transparency uh, between uh, the competitors and the reviewers and judges in terms of the metrics that uh, will, be, uh, will be used. So there are three factors that uh, we've defined and thought about. Uh, so the first is impact score. So what is the impact that the solution has on the family and the community? And this means, does it address their aspirations? Does it address the things that they would like to do with the resources they have and what they want to do in their life? The second is the technology score. So how is technology and it doesn't just mean power electronics. It just means all the technology elements that we've talked about, right? And power electronics is one important piece of it, I think. But, uh, you know, it may be an existing solution from power electronics that is integrated in. Okay, so how does technology solve key challenges, especially the scaling problem, which is really the heart of uh, the problem? And the third is business score. So, you know, is the business model kind of demonstrating economic viability, scaling, and sustainability? So these are three. Now, will we get all of these at the same level, especially the first time around? No. 
But we, what we want teams to do is make sure that we're not solving a technical problem that nobody else in the world cares about. It really needs to be addressing the, uh, the needs of this, uh, this community as we, as we go along. So we have an, a, a, a judging process, and you can see this uh, when you look at the competition guide uh, online. Uh, I'm not going to go through the details. This is an eye chart. Okay? But uh, again, you can see examples out here. So you know, impact score, does it create value for the family and the community? Okay? Um, does it meet the basic low energy use needs and does it expand to meet high energy use? Does it enhance income earning potential? Does it meet critical community needs? Okay? So these are very important uh, elements that we've talked about in terms of value for family and community. Is it easy for the target family to use or do I need a PhD to kind of, uh, you know, go through the screen and the touch screens and everything else to be able to, uh, to operate this? Okay? I mean, my my simplest, when I had I started my first company, my team wanted to put uh, a beautiful touch screen with uh, everything on it and a PC behind it. I said, no, I want a green button and a red button. Okay, that I think any, everybody can use. And so that's, I mean, can you make it that simple? And I don't know the answer uh, to that, but I mean, the teams have to figure that out. Is it affordable? Does it meet the family cost and service targets and expandability? Does it give them flexible pricing payments options and PAYGO, so, you know, and, and PAYGO capability? On the technology score, generation, storage, power delivery, environmental footprint, normal, you know, power energy access type of uh, things. Is it scalable? Is it expandable? You know, is it, what's the ease of installing, commissioning, maintaining, and servicing the system, especially a fleet of these devices? You know, cloud connectivity, you know, do, you know, is that available because that could give you a certain different level of uh, uh, optimization uh, capability? And what other system optimization analytics, you know, does it enable that? Because that's another level of optimization. And then the business side, you know, is there a simple financial model including the key assumptions that shows economic viability? Uh, you know, what's the billing and collection model? Uh, you know, how do you manage dropping prices? Okay, we, you know, on the one hand, we, we like exponential prices because the prices are going down, but, but if I'm an entrepreneur and I come in and I build a business case uh, when the price is uh, 10 cents a kilowatt hour and in uh, three years it's gone to 5 cents a kilowatt hour, how the hell do I make money at it? Right? So, I mean, that is, I think, a really important uh, element that needs to be uh, addressed in terms of uh, resiliency. And the second one is, if my customer can only pay sporadically, is my business model going to be able to sustain that? And what, uh, how am I going to kind of use to kind of uh, to smooth out the uh, irregularities out there? You know, is it based on subsidies? Uh, is there some novel funding mechanism? I mean, one thing we don't think is right is the philanthropic model. We can't keep going, you know, saying that I'm going to keep going to the Gates Foundation and collect money uh, and, uh, and deploy a billion of these devices. That's not a sustainable uh, model. And then across the board out here, we think we have absolutely no clue what innovations people are going to come up with. Uh, and we're saying, you know, wow us, tell us, show us that you could do this whole thing with two sticks and one stone. I mean, that'd be great. I mean, that, you know, there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. Uh, and so we want to kind of keep that uh, you know, wide open for, uh, for people. So the areas of innovation, you know, yes, you could in principle, you know, be wonderful and do technology and business model innovation. On the other hand, we think that the teams are going to be kind of slightly different. They're going to either use a technology innovation in some existing business model or a business innovation in existing technology, uh, you know, kind of model. And that's fine. Okay? We think that this round is going to tell us what is possible. It's going to allow people to kind of converge and become a community. And the next cycle, you're going to learn from everything that this cycle has done. And this, you know, keep kind of building uh, on top of itself. So that's the excitement that, uh, you know, we think, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is the reason why, you know, we've spent an inordinate amount of time over the last uh, two years. Uh, trying to pull this together. We're I mean, happy to see, you know, kind of excitement in the community. We're happy to see things coming uh, out in terms of, uh, uh, you, know, you know, kind of uh, teams that are uh, prospective uh, participants. Uh, and uh, we're now reaching out and kind of beginning to uh, close the loop with the, uh, the funding community and everything else. Uh, I would say that the, uh, you know, the, the Regional Round for Americas uh, is going to be in Puerto Rico. Uh, it's going to be December 30th to, uh, uh, to January, you know, uh, sorry, January 30th to February 1st. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would encourage people to, you know, participate in that. There's a call for papers outside. Uh, and, uh, you know, that again is beginning to kind of bring energy access into the, into the technology fold of the market society. So, you know, lots of opportunity out there to participate as well.
So with that, I think I'm going to uh, open it up for uh, you know for more questions, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, we've given you a flavor for what the competition is about. We would love to see uh, you know people uh, kind of uh, jumping in and participating. Uh, you know, Dillard is here. I'm here. Uh, Jane is uh, there. Yushin is here. There's a whole bunch of us are uh, involved uh, in the competition. So if not here, do come and talk to us after. We'll try to you know answer questions. So please, you know, let's open this up for, for discussion. We are happy to have as detailed discussion, technology, whatever you want to. Do. So. Are we going to see a surge in the number of teams the next week? I'm certainly hoping so. Uh, I, I think, you know, more than anything else, I mean, especially from, I mean, if there are people from companies who would like to be looking at kind of working on sponsoring or kind of participating in the way, talk to us. Uh, but I mean, I'm thinking university teams must put something together, okay? Yeah. You can address uh, the challenge from other regions, regardless of which region you're located. Right. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the challenge here is going to be if you're from the U.S., okay, how do you get a field evaluation in a target community? Well, we have places like Haiti that are really nearby, okay, which uh, we've already been working out there, and there are big communities out there that can, can you know, have something like this installed and. Uh, and tested and evaluated. So I think the opportunities are, are there. And like I said, I mean, you know, I, I'm blown away by the level of technology that is really needed to make these systems work the way they need to. And they're all exponential technologies. And they all can be done at a cost. I mean, you know, they all have smartphones right now. I mean, think about it, right? This is about as good as it gets. Yes. That's a, that's a um, so I, I think there is money being put in venture capital in this, not as much as should be, right? I mean, uh, in in the entire area of energy, okay, VC investments in 2006 were about 65 percent of uh, total investments. Last year was two percent. So it's been actually because it's been very hard for them to make money at this. This is part of the challenge. Okay, even some of the, uh, I mean, you know, clearly there are companies like, uh, uh, you know, B-Box and uh, M Copa and all and D-Light that are kind of doing good work in the space and are, are growing. Okay, but I mean, a lot more needs to happen, I think. Uh, and I think this is the, the chance to do it. There are special prizes for student teams. Okay, you know, exactly because of what you're saying, okay, because I mean, you know, we expect that student teams are probably not going to be at the same level of technical, you know, technical maturity. But what student teams can do well is, you know, knit together a coalition of people from business and entrepreneurship and this and that and, and, and look, for, you know, with a fresh set of eyes at, uh, at the problems. And I think we're seeing a lot of student teams actually enrolling in this. So we're, we're actually quite, quite pleased with that. Then, you know, and that's one of the reasons we've got a track that is separate for commercial. So if somebody like a B-Box or uh, U-Solar or somebody wants to participate, well, they will be in that commercial track. Okay? And uh, so, you know, that's the whole reason for that too. If you have no questions, then I would like to encourage everyone to uh, follow us on Twitter. Uh, you know, please tweet us about. Uh, please tweet about us. Uh, our handle is hashtag #EmpowerBillion. We have a LinkedIn group. Feel free to join us and uh, make sure to check out our website as well. Yeah, definitely check out the website. I think it's good job. And be actively involved. And we're looking for volunteers. We're looking for people who want to be involved. This is a great. At, uh, Initiative. Yeah, and if you would like to participate in the mashup, then please, you know, just after this presentation, come to the front and then we can talk. And yeah. with this, I think, yep. thank you very much thank for you. attending today, and we are looking forward to your interest. Thank you.